Cigarette smoking is the single most preventable cause of illness, disability, and premature death in much of the world. The mortality rate for smokers is 70% higher than, not, than for non-smokers. Half of all deaths uh, due to cardiovascular disease, lung cancer, and chronic obstruction pulmonary disease are smoking related. An adult who has smoked two packs per day for 20 years can expect to lose eight years off of their life. It's not my fault, I don't have anything to do with it. I didn't come up with the statistics. You're killing yourself. BPDE, benzo a pyrene diol epoxide, is a chemical in cigarette smoke. Uh, is it, it's a causative agent of, uh, of lung cancer. It's in the paper, damn it. So go ahead, keep smoking those cigarettes uh, out of that really, or that carcinogenic paper. BPDE uh, damages a cancer suppressor gene causing lung tissue to mutate. Uh, women are more susceptible to the carcinogens in tobacco than men are. Once upon a time, men died of lung cancer far more frequently than women did because of tobacco. Then women started smoking more, and now women die more frequently than men. Actually, you've caught up with men. So I congratulate you on, on, on <laughs> making it, uh, on, on having an equal number of people dying of cancer. So congratulations. Uh, nicotine causes serum cholesterol to rise, uh, increases risk of, uh, it increases the risk of miscarriage, sudden infant death, and low birth weight infants in pregnant women. Uh, one of the things that happens to a baby whose mother smoked, uh, they uh, are more uh, likely to be ADHD. Uh, they're more likely to have other mental illnesses. Like kind of smoke? I'm sorry? Like kind of smoke like cigarettes? Or, or and marijuana. Oh, oh yeah, marijuana is equally as bad as, as tobacco. What about <laughs> Meth is like instant death anyway. <laughs> no, you shouldn't be doing any of that stuff if you're pregnant. I had a friend that, it wasn't my friend, what am I talking about? He was one of my students, and he was a, uh, he was a marijuana smoker, and he swore that marijuana was the best thing in the whole wide world. It was organic, it couldn't hurt anybody. All tobacco is organic too, and look at all the people that it kills. But uh, he said that if his wife, he would, he would suggest that his wife smoke marijuana to control nausea if she had morning sickness. He's going to feed her marijuana. It's stupid. And I told him, don't do it. It's not very smart. It causes problems. And he said it's all propaganda. So I don't know. I hope he never gets married. Uh, smoking effects uh, disguised as aging. Uh, this is the individual that, these are twin sisters. One is a smoker, the other is not a smoker. This is the one that doesn't smoke. This is the one that does smoke, as you can look, as you can tell. She looks a little bit, she looks older than her sister does. Uh, her skin is, she has more wrinkles. Uh, her skin tone is different. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, not as pink. Um, her hair looks better. I haven't figured that one out. She has earrings on. Anyway, they're, they're twin sisters. And as you can see, she's got the wrinkles uh, around her mouth, uh, whereas this one doesn't. Uh, this one look, looks much younger than the other one does. They're in their, they are in their 50s. <clears throat> Environmental tobacco smoke, or ETS, contains an even higher concentration of many carcinogens. So if you're, even if you're a smoker, don't, don't kill your kid. Uh, secondhand smoke is, is actually in some ways, it's more dangerous than first-hand smoke. Non-smokers who are regularly exposed to ETS are at increased risk for cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease. Uh, why do people smoke? Uh, initiation. Uh, initial use is, uh, is unpleasant. Uh, if you've ever, has anybody ever smoked in here a, a cigarette? Did you get sick the first time you smoked? Did you turn green? <laughs> when I was in the service, we couldn't smoke for the first three weeks of, of basic training. So when they finally did let us smoke, I didn't smoke. But uh, and the, the, the amazing thing was that these guys were carrying their cigarettes around for three weeks, and they weren't allowed to smoke. That was the funny part. That was the most amazing part. 
So they, we, they finally let us smoke just before we got our shots. We got inoculated. Uh, or they let us smoke afterwards, actually. Uh, so uh, uh, all these guys are blazing up, and, and uh, you know, half of them are vomiting. They're turning green. I mean, it was nasty. The one guy passed out. I laugh, and you know, the sad thing is he passed out, hit his head, they put him in the hospital, and they had to move him back. So he lost a whole week of those. And uh, that was a tragedy. And, and he had to leave our unit. So don't cry, will you? He eventually graduated, uh, he had that big lump on his head. It was really kind of fun. <clears throat> so initial use is unpleasant. Uh, social contacts, uh, role modeling, and peer influence lead many teenagers to start smoking. Uh, advertising, of course, plays a major role. Not so much anymore. They don't allow people, they don't allow tobacco companies to advertise uh, on television at all. Uh, they can still advertise in uh, print media, uh, but they have to have a disclaimer on the, in the uh, advertisement. Uh, once upon a time, they, they uh, would advertise using the Joe Camel as they uh, to advertise uh, to try to get teenagers to smoke. And Joe, Joe Camel's the coolest guy in the whole wide world. He's a, he rides motorcycles. He rides camels. He's a camel that rides a camel. Maybe they used to have like camel cash too. Camel cash, you bet. Like, oh, uh, yeah. You collect them just as like anything. You can get cash oh, them. Uh, whatever. Yeah. Uh, Cigarette lighters. I got cool. a buckle. You got a belt buckle? Oh, I've always wanted that. <laughs> a Joe Camel belt buckle. Oh, I'm jealous. They do, used to do the same thing with Mountain Dew, but I, they don't do it anymore. I don't know why. Just video games. People that play video games drink Mountain Dew. Especially Code Red. If you notice, when they advertise Mountain Dew, they always adver advertise the green stuff, yeah. the yellow stuff. <clears throat> they have started uh, advertising Code Red, too, at the same time, as weird as that is. So I have a feeling, you know, they have all those really weird flavors like Baja, Blast, and, and uh, you know, the white stuff, and the blue stuff, and the ugh, created orange stuff. <clears throat> But they've started advertising just the code red and the yellow stuff, which is all equally poison. I mean, it's all bad stuff for me. But I drink it anyway because I'm stupid. I don't drink the good stuff like iced tea. <coughs> iced tea tastes like well, I'm not tell you what it tastes like to me. <clears throat> Low, okay, vulnerability effects in teens who uh, start smoking. Low feelings of competence and control. Um, because they are smoking and they can't stop. Perception, perception of lack of social support, uh, rebelliousness, and it's always good to, to be a rebel, uh, strong uh, need for independence uh, among these individuals, and of course, if you smoke, it controls your stress. Uh, maintenance, uh, biological factors come into play as heavy smokers develop dependence on nicotine, uh, there are reinforcing properties in smoking. Nicotine stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, causing the release of catecholamines and serotonin, stimulating dopamine release in the brain's reward system, and inducing relaxation. Who could be possibly more relaxed than this kid is? Smoking a cigarette. Ah, he's maybe five, six years old. Coolest kid in the whole county. <clears throat> Schachter and colleagues first introduced the nicotine titration model in 1977. The theory that smokers who are physically dependent on nicotine regulate their smoking to maintain a steady level of the drug in their body. And if you've ever been around a, a smoker, sometimes they have to go outside. Uh, I used to work with a lady that hated my guts, couldn't stand my voice. If I said something, she would have to leave the room. So as it turned out, if we were in a meeting, and I started talking, she would get up and she would need a cigarette. It made her need a cigarette. That's how strong my voice is. I can make people need a cigarette. <laughs> uh, she's dead. <clears throat> she's dead. She died in an automobile accident. All the people that were mean to me died, have died. How about that? So be careful. 
<laughs> she died in an automobile accident. Uh, hang on, she hated me so much. Schachter discovered that most smokers smoke, a pro and my boss, she was a, the dean of academics, thought it was the funniest thing in the world because they were really good friends. And the dean loved me, <coughs> not that kind of love, filial love, okay, brotherly love. She really liked me. And uh, so she thought it was the funniest thing in the world that her best friend and, and this guy that she really liked uh, hated each other. I didn't hate her, and she hated me. I didn't care. She was a math teacher. What do I what do I care about a math teacher? You can't talk to him. My son's a math teacher. What am I talking about? Schachter experimented with nicotine levels and discovered that uh, when given lower nicotine cigarettes, the smokers increased their consumption, and when given higher nicotine cigarettes, they lowered their uh, their their consumption. So we titrated in our own bodies. If you've ever watched people smoking. Uh, which is always fascinating. A lot of times they just hold it in their, their fingers. And the reason is because they're titrating. Uh, they, they're taking in a select amount of nicotine. They can only tolerate a select amount of nicotine. So they hold it in their fingers until they need another blast of nicotine. And then they'll take a puff. It also gives them a dopamine spike. It gives them a positive feeling when they, when they take in the nicotine. So they're... they're um, controlling the amount of positive feelings they're having, and they're also controlling the amount of nicotine in their system. So if you have somebody that needs a lot of nicotine in their system, they'll be taking puffs all uh, constantly. But if it's somebody that doesn't need it that much nicotine, they'll just hold it in their fingers and they'll talk to people, and then every once in a while they'll take a puff. Uh, but the other people are just, you know, they're bouncing back and forth with their fingers. Smoking cigarettes. <clears throat> or they're smoking four cigarettes at a time. Twin and adoption studies have shown that heritability of smoking uh, tobacco is about 60%. Uh, Lehman et al. in 1999 found that people with DRD2 gene allele called 9-repeat allele are less efficient and remo uh, at removing excess dopamine from their synapses, and so they don't have the need for dopamine stimulation. So there are some people out there with a select gene who don't need to smoke at all. And so if they ever start smoking, they don't, they don't continue smoking. I have uh, uh, five brothers and sisters. One of them's dead, but uh, I have a brother that smokes, and he's the only brother that does. The rest of us, if we started smoking, or we put it down fairly quickly. Everybody else. My oldest sister was a feminist, and she started smoking those really pretty cigarettes, thinking that it, it made she, it made her rebellious. <laughs> she couldn't tolerate it. She just couldn't tolerate it. But I have a brother that smokes, and you know why he smokes? It's a girl. Oh my. This is the connection between he and his wife, is the fact that when she smokes, he goes out to smoke with her. He never goes out to smoke by himself. He always goes out and smokes with her. So he does it, well, we go into why, he, why he's doing it, but it has to do with romance. <laughs> he does it for that reason. What a jerk. No, that's not true. You know, guys will do a lot of different things for that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Men are just single-minded. There's something, something wrong with men. The effect uh, management model uh, proposes that smokers strive to regulate their emotional states. Positive effects, smokers are trying to increase stimulation, feel relaxed, or are uh, trying to create some other positive emotional state. A negative uh, effect, smokers trying to reduce anxiety, guilt, fe fear, or other negative emotions. This is uh, one of the reasons why people smoke uh, if they're in a combat situation. They're trying to relieve their anxiety. They're trying to make themselves feel better. Because it's tough. So a lot of times, right after an engagement, you'll see a lot of people light up. Even though it's dangerous to light that cigarette. Because what you're doing is telling you. Telling the other, telling the bad guys that you're there, so you're lighting up. As dumb as that is. <clears throat> Information uh, campaigns, uh, successful campaigns provide non-smoking peer role models 
They shift the social prototype associated with smoking. That's what they're trying to do anyway. Traditional campaigns have been less effective uh, among ethnic minorities who are targeted by tobacco advertising. Uh, there is, uh, once upon a time, uh, Miller High Life uh, tried to target, uh, this is alcohol, of course, not tobacco, but they were trying to target uh, Hispanics. They were trying to get Hispanics to drink their beer. I'm trying to think what they called their beer. They gave their beer an, an initials uh, as their name. I can't remember. MGB? MGB? Mil 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 Miller Genuine Draft. So instead of calling it Miller Genuine Draft, which they would have done for white people, uh, for, for Europeans, uh, they called it MGD, MGB, D, MGD, MGD. And that was to target the Hispanic population. Because a lot of Hispanics don't really speak English. So calling it Miller Genuine Draft doesn't mean anything to them. But calling it MGD, they, they know initials just like everybody else does. And actually in Spanish, MGD is MGD. It's pronounced MGD. So there you go. Increasing aversive consequences, increase the aversive consequences of smoking, increasing the cigarette tax is highly effective, as is increasing the punishment associated with underage smoking, banning of, of smoking in public areas, and that's what we have done in the United States. Cigarettes are now up to $6 a pack. There you go, $6 a pack. When I was in the service, I could buy a carton of cigarettes for $2.40 or something like that. So we would, this is what we would do in Germany. We would uh, buy cartons of cigarettes and give it to the Germans because they were taxing the hell out of those things. These guys would have to put in, you know, like 10 marks in order to get a pack of cigarettes. And they were like old cigarette packs. And of course, all the American cigarettes were, were fresher. It was a milder blend. Uh, so that's what we used to do. Uh, you can't smoke in any public area. You can smoke, there are a couple places on campus where you can smoke. You certainly can't smoke in any building, but uh, you can go out back and smoke. I, there's, a, there's one right in front of the cafeteria, isn't there? There's a smoking it's, thing. Uh, there, there used to be one over by the post office, but I, don't, I think that was gone. Anyway, you can smoke on campus, but my, I, I hardly ever smell tobacco on people. Hardly ever. I did that. I did that. Right brought what I did. Right. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Your ideas of relationships are different, different than mine. Inoculation programs uh, teach adolescents practical skills in resist resisting social pressures to smoke. Everybody else is smoking, so I want to smoke too. And of course, saying no is not the easiest thing in the world, especially when you're a teenager. Teenagers want to be just like everybody else. They want to be cool, just like everybody else. The most successful programs are based on social learning model, uh, which focuses on three variables that influence initiation of smoking. Uh, one is social pressure, the other is medical information, and the other is targeting the anxiety caused by the smoking. A program developed by Richard Evans in 2003 for adolescents uses films, role playing, and rehearsal. Uh, these, practice, uh, these practice and knowledge sessions help teens develop their social skills and refusal skills. Smoking inoculation in the 7th and 8th grade cuts the probability of smoking in half. So this is one of the things that we try to do. It is estimated that inoculation and cessation programs have saved 3 million lives by keeping children from ever starting and getting adults to quit smoking. Every day, 4,000 new teens take their first puff. Uh, 2,000 of them will become smokers. Most, half of them uh, will not pick it up because maybe it's, they have DRD2 and they don't, they don't need it. Programs fall into two categories, addiction model and cognitive behavioral approaches. Addiction model treatments are, are moderately successful as a standalone treatment. Uh, nicotine gum, of course you see this, Nicoderm. No, Nicoderm is a, the patch you put on your arm. Transdermal patches, that's the nicotine. What is this? The, the tobacco. I mean, the, the, the chewing gum. Nicorette. Nicorette. It's nic nicorette. It's, it's a nicotine gum. Inhalers, you can use ch Chantix, which blocks dopamine. 
Uh, Chantix is actually a fairly strong um, drug, uh, and using Chantix can cause hallucinations, which they tell you in the, in the advertisements. And Zyban, of course, is another. It increases your dopamine level so that you don't need to smoke. So this Chantix actually blocks dopamine, and Zyban increases dopamine. Now the problem with Chantix, if you take Chantix, is that it's blocking your dopamine. Ah, so you have a hard time being happy. And people don't like it because of that. They have bad dreams. Gives them bad dreams. So it's like dropping acid and taking a bad trip using Chantix. It's, now they've got a new advertisement, uh, going cold turkey. Go, instead of going cold turkey, you go slow turkey. And then they have this turkey walking around really slow. And mowing is long. I don't know. It's a dumb thing. Does it convince people? Do, do people want, really want to be turkeys? And the answer is probably no. The cognitive behavioral treatment satiation. Uh, satiation is one of the, uh, the cognitive behavioral treatments. Uh, it's a form of aversion therapy in which a smoker is forced to increase smoking until an unpleasant state of fullness is reached. This is known as rapid smoking. They'll put them in a room uh, and they'll give them all the cigarettes they want and they tell them they have to, have to light up another cigarette every 10 minutes. And eventually they get sick. So that's aversion therapy. Sometimes they throw up, sometimes they don't. It, you feel like it, you do did the first time you smoked. You turn green, you know, the whole thing. There's a, there's, a opposite, there's a reverse of that one of one of the films of uh, Stephen King's uh, Cat's Eye. It's like multiple stories, and there's one of uh, I think James Woods is this one, where uh, he goes into treatment, and they take about his family, and whatever they know about him, they put him in a, in a room to where they you know this is, smoke a cigarette, I guess they, they put a, a cat in there and they electrocute him and say, oh, no. don't replace that cat with your wife. <laughs> and he didn't believe it in here, I guess. It's, but the whole, whole ordeal, I guess he was like trying to sneak a cigarette. <laughs> Finally he got a hit of it, I guess he, somebody saw him. So I, guess, I guess it's like a... It's, it's, it's well, a, so they, they Stephen, electrocute his Stephen wife? King, so Stephen King's like... <laughs> <laughs> That's horrible. Of course, interventions need to be targeted to specific groups and take into account cultural traditions, values, and gender. The cultural traditions, of course, uh, many uh, uh, American Indians, of course, uh, see tobacco as, as holy. Um, up north, if you want uh, to do a ceremony, all you need to do is give somebody a pack of cigarettes or you, know, uh, you need to give them tobacco, and they have to do the ceremony. And that's the only charge is tobacco. But that's a different, different place, different time, different group. Uh, successful programs with adolescents are those that enhance uh, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation to quit uh, through education and the use of rewards. They are tailored to developmental needs rather than being based on adult programs. They provide social supports. Uh, they, it makes teens aware of their resources for remaining nicotine free, of course. And of course, you'll live longer but most teenagers don't really recognize living longer as a, as a positive thing. Quitting smoking is determined by three individual factors. This is according to Lichtenstein and Glasgow uh, in 1997. A motivation to quit including persistent despite withdrawal symptoms, persistence despite withdrawal symptoms, level of physical dependence on nicotine, and barriers to or supports in remaining smoke. Three, break that cigarette, and that's the end of the chapter. Don't smoke if you're pregnant. Don't smoke anything if you're pregnant, whether it's meth or whether it's marijuana. It's all bad stuff. There's a lot of negative things out there. You don't really want to do that. What's chapter 10? Chapter 10, cardiovascular disease and diabetes. This is very important here on the reservation because diabetes is relatively prevalent. Uh, it's not as bad as in some places, but it's still bad enough. Uh, if we're dealing with uh, Hispanics and, or American Indians, we're dealing with a large population who uh, accumulate their fat in, around their waists. And because of that, of course, it can cause all kinds of interesting problems. 
Your heart's about the size of your fist. It weighs about 11 ounces. Uh, it consists of three layers of tissue. The, the, exit, the uh, uh, epicardium is the protective layer on the outside. The endocardium is the protective layer on the inside. And in between is the myocardium. The myocardium is the actual muscle. Myo meaning muscle. Cardium meaning heart. Myocardium, it's heart muscle. The myocardium pumps five or more quarts of blood each minute through four chambers of the, of the heart. Five quarts. Or more, depending on what you're doing. If you're running, it'll probably pump more. The heart itself is supplied with blood from a branch of the aorta. Actually, there are two branches, uh, which allows the blood to pump throughout the heart to keep it supplied with blood and, and uh, keep it healthy. Uh, I can show you where I had my heart attack. Are you ready? This is where my blockage was. It was right here. I had 93% occlusion. Uh, going up to 97. And you may ask yourself, why would this person who exercises all the time, why in the world would he have a heart attack? And the problem was that I exercised all the time. And I had stretched those blood vessels out. And because I had stretched them out, I had created a loop right here. They created a loop. And when I was under stress, I'd just gotten fired from my job. When I was under stress, it caused that loop to shut down. And because it shut down, I only had uh, like 7% was pumping through my body. By the time they did surgery on me, uh, and the surgery was just a heart cap. Uh, they ran a tube uh, from my femoral artery uh, in my groin uh, all the way up into my heart. My heart's over here, and they've used my right leg. It's, 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 it's logical. There's a logic to it. Uh, anyway, they ran it up from my right leg, it ran it through my shoulder, and it down into my heart. <clears throat> and when they went in there, they found this loop. And they took pictures of it, which was the coolest thing in the world. I've got these pictures at home. They took a picture of it. And they took it before they, they straightened the loop out. They, they uh, took it uh, after they straightened the loop out. So I had this loop. And the reason I had a loop is because I was a runner. I was a sprinter. I was a weightlifter. I did all these things that, that uh, all these aerobic things uh, that uh, were highly stressful. And they required uh, me to, to really activate my heart. And because of that, because I was a quarter miler, because I... I uh, ran for six years because I was a weightlifter and I lifted, I maxed out uh, from time to time. Because of the, all of these things that I did to myself, I stretched out these blood vessels in my heart. <clears throat> and as soon as, as something stressful happened to me, I'd been divorced twice and that wasn't st stressful enough. But when I was fired from my job, it was so stressful that uh, my uh, cardiovascular system uh, didn't really collapse, that's not really the right word, it became affected. And when it get, became affected, all those loops that I had created in my heart because I was so healthy, uh, they kind of closed up. And they needed to put uh, plastic tubing in there to, to straighten them out. And these are called stents. They're not really, pla it's not solid plastic, it's a webbing that they put in. And so this has happened to me three times. They put these, they they put this webbing in my heart three to, three different places, three different times. So because of working out, you created new blood vessels, and you got stre stressed out, and they closed. Well, them. they didn't create new blood vessels. I just stretched out the blood vessels. Oh yeah, stressed out. Yeah, I just. Stretched. So I created loops. Now, if you look at these blood vessels, they're attached. They're attached to your heart. So when I stretched them out, I kind of stretched them up, away from the heart. <clears throat> so what they had to do is put those stints in there. And they've done it to me three times. And of course, unfortunately, I'm not sensitive to morphine. They keep giving me morphine. And I keep waking up during surgery. Whoops. <laughs> so if you want to know what it feels like to have a heart cap done, it feels like they take a garden hose and they make this hole in your femoral artery and they stick it up through your, up through your leg and it goes up all the way up here comes right through your shoulder. And this is the part that hurt the most. My shoulder hurt. It still does. I can still feel it. Even though they didn't do anything. 
So then they want to down into the car and fix everything. And that's how they th shot the stint in there. They, you know, it's a tube, so they could they could put things in there. Uh, they can they can expand a balloon, so if you've got too much cholesterol, they can smash it up against the side of the the uh, blood vessel, to, so that it's it's not blocking your blood vessel. But I didn't have that problem. I had my problem were loops because I'm so damn healthy. <clears throat> And the, the guy said that I would have, should have died. I should have died because, um, because my heart attack should have, it should have been 100%, and in which case the heart would have died. Uh, but because I was such a healthy person, I, I was able to live with only getting 7% of my blood flowing through my, my heart. If I was a smoker, I would have died. If I was a drinker, I would have died. If I was didn't exercise as much as I did, I would have died. So there you go. <clears throat> but then again, if I didn't exercise so much, I potentially wouldn't have had the problem anyway. Cardiovascular disease, disorder of the heart and blood vessel system, including stroke and coronary heart disease. Uh, 60, 60 million Americans suffer from cardiovascular disease, including me. 34.3% will die every year not including me. I haven't died yet, so so there you go. Uh, coronary heart disease is the slow blockage of the coronary arteries through atherosclerosis, a uh, chronic disease in which the arteries that supply the heart become narrowed or clogged with atheromatous uh, uh, plaque. Um, this is the study that we were doing in the Air Force. We were, we were studying cardiovascular disease and, and, and uh, uh, coronary heart disease. This is what we were studying, trying to figure out why these pilots were dying while, when they started pulling G's, um, especially lots of G's. <clears throat> and they were crashing their airplanes, and of course that's the reason they wanted to stop that, because they were crashing their airplanes. Not because they were dying. Who cares if a pilot dies? It's just a dead, one more dead human. Would you crash a um, uh, five million dollar airplane? That's, that's what they didn't like. They didn't like the $5 million airplanes crashing. So we needed to figure out what was going on. And of course, that's uh, one of the things we discovered was atherosclerosis. We discovered cholesterol. We discovered uh, triglycerides. And we discovered why people were getting coronary heart, coronary heart disease. Atherosclerosis is chronic condition in which cholesterol and other fats are deposited to the inner wall of the coronary arteries, reducing circulation to the heart of course, this is a, can be a really serious problem, and that's one of the reasons why we do uh, heart caths in order to smash this stuff, stuff back up against the edge so that it's not blocking the uh, artery. Atherogenesis is atheromatous uh, plaques form in arteries uh, inner lining, and that's atherogenesis. Atherosclerosis is the hardening of the arteries, a chronic disease in which blood vessels lose their elasticity because of atheromatous plaque buildup. Uh, the body reacts to the athero, uh, arteriosclerosis by trying to combat it with inflammation, inflammatory cytokines. One cytokine that we can measure is C-reactive protein. Uh, it's, if you had strep throat, we could, uh, we could find out how bad your strep throat was by, running, by doing a C-reactive protein. If you had um, walking pneumonia, we could find out how bad it was by doing a C-reactive protein. So, <clears throat> now we can um, uh, find out how bad your uh, atherosclerosis is by measuring your C-reactive protein. But of course, a uh, uh, positive uh, uh, problem that, that causes a positive result, a false positive result, would be if you had a, a bacterial infection, if you had strep throat, or you had uh, uh, other potential problems, walking pneumonia or whatever. It would cause a false positive C-reactive protein. Angina pectoris literally translates to chest pain. Uh, it is uh, a condition of extreme chest pain caused by a restriction of the blood supply to the heart. Angina means there is a blockage in the heart that is causing the heart to malfunction to the level that it causes a tightening of chest muscles. And this is known as angina pectoris. Pectoris is, is uh, chest, 
and angina is pain. It may be a warning that a heart attack is imminent. Uh, the pain can be relieved with nitroglycerin, which sounds kind of funny. Uh, that's the stuff we blow things up with. Uh, but if we give you uh, nitroglycerin, uh, then you can, then it will dissipate your pain. Take your pain away. Now the problem is, and this isn't really a problem, we can give you a transdermal patch with nitroglycerin on it, or we can take a pill, a nitroglycerin pill, and we can put it uh, sublingual. We can put it underneath your tongue. If we put it in your mouth, your, your uh, digestive uh, juices in your mouth, and your salivary glands will, will destroy the nitroglycerin. It doesn't work. We have to put it under your tongue so that it will, uh, will uh, uh, dissipate into your body uh, through your, uh, the mucous membrane underneath your tongue. There are no salivary glands underneath your tongue, as bizarre as that sounds. So if we just give you that pill and you swallow it, you'll destroy all the nitroglycerin. But if we put it under your tongue, uh, you, your salivary glands will not be able to destroy it. Your <coughs> saliva won't be able to destroy it, as bizarre as that sounds. So when I had my heart attack and I had chest pains, they kept giving me nitroglycerin and they put it under my tongue. The problem was I didn't have enough saliva to dissolve. I, there wasn't enough moisture underneath my tongue to dissolve in the nitroglycerin. That was a problem. So I kept saying, well, I'll just pull it up out, of, out from underneath my tongue and, and that should take care of it. And they said, no, that won't work because the saliva, of course, destroys the nitroglycerin. Whoops. Myocardial infarction. Myo means muscle, cardial means heart, heart muscle infarction. Infarction means death, death of the heart muscle. A heart attack in, it is a uh, myocardial infarction is a heart attack, the permanent death of a heart tissue in response to an interruption of blood supply. Uh, my dad had a heart attack when he was, how old was he? 65, 60, 66. Uh, at that time, they didn't do heart caths. That was a brand new procedure. Uh, so they, they cracked his chest uh, and uh, they did an open heart surgery. Uh, turned out he had six blocked arteries and they were able to fix five of them. They tried to fix the sixth one, but it didn't take. So he had part of his heart was dead. This is when he was 65. Uh, the back part of his heart was dead. It was no longer living tissue. And he lived for another 25 years with, with half of his heart dead. The back part of his heart was dead. It was about a third of his heart. It wasn't that much. You can live with the dead, with dead areas in your heart, of course. Uh, five of them took, and, and that was a positive thing. Now, the funny thing about my dad, and I, this isn't funny, I mean, like funny, peculiar, I guess, is uh, he had uh, uh, bad heart valves. And uh, when <laughs> when he first tried to get into the army during uh, in the 1940s, in 1940 actually, uh, he had a heart murmur and they wouldn't let him in. Uh, he also had hemorrhoids, and uh, so he was 4F when he first went uh, to, uh, to to be drafted. Uh, he was 4F and he couldn't get into the army, uh, so he went, he had his hemorrhoids operated on, and he exercised more, and his heart murmur went away. And so then they let him in the army, and he was in the army for the next 35 years. And of course, he didn't, didn't die. He didn't die in Europe, and he certainly didn't die afterwards. Didn't die until he was 90 years old. He died of something totally different. Didn't have anything to do with his heart. He had psoriasis so bad that his skin went away. I mean, there was hardly any skin left on his body. And he couldn't maintain his body temperature because your skin keeps your heat in, keeps your moisture in. And he didn't have that because his skin was that thin. And that's really what killed him. A stroke is a cer cerebrovascular accident that uh, results in the, the damage to the brain due to a lack of oxygen. Uh, strokes can be caused by a blood clot that includes uh, blood uh, from uh, from getting to a portion of the brain, or it can be caused by a hemorrhage where the artery breaks open and it bleeds out. So you can either have a, a blood clot or you can have a hemorrhage. Normally, a uh, stroke is caused by a blood clot. Why? Any, uh, any ideas why people die more from, from a blood clot than a hemorrhage? Why would, 
Why would blood clots be so prevalent? Are you ready for this? As it turns out, if you smoke cigarettes, it makes your platelets sticky. So you're more likely to, uh, to uh, develop a clot if you smoke. Isn't that fun? If you smoke cigarettes, if you smoke marijuana, <laughs> it doesn't make your platelets sticky. It's also a vasodilator, so it makes your blood vessels expand. If you've got a weak spot in your brain, a blood vessel with a weak spot, it will break open. So if you smoke pot, you're more likely to die of a, of a hemorrhage. If you smoke cigarettes, you're more likely to die of a, of a blood clot. Isn't that fun? <laughs> uh, but don't worry, don't worry. We've got, a, we've got a drug that we can give you that will keep you from dying. Are you ready for this? But you've got to figure out whether it's a hemorrhage or a clot because this thing breaks up clots. 70% of all uh, strokes are because of a blood clot. I think I'm going to say that in a minute. Uh, this CT scan uh, is of the brain of a 70-year-old stroke victim. Uh, it shows uh, when the blood flow to the brain is blocked, cells in the brain may be destroyed. And right here is where the clot was. The clot's right over here. The darkened area on the right side uh, shows where the brain tissues uh, tissue has died because of an inadequate blood supply. The lack of blood may be due to an obstruction in a cerebral artery or to the hemorrhaging of, or of a weakened uh, artery wall. The result is paralysis or weakness in the left side of the body since the tissue destroyed is on the right side of the body and it controls the left side of your, of your body. The left side of the brain, right side of the body. Okay. <clears throat> Are you ready for this? This is fun. This is good stuff. We can fix your, we can fix your stroke. We have the ability to fix your stroke. Every minute and a half, on average, uh, someone in the United States uh, suffers from a stroke. That's 795,000 strokes a year. Since 1996, there's been an approved drug called TPA for tissue plasminogen activator uh, that, according to some big studies, can often break up the clot, restore blood flow, and prevent much permanent damage if the drug is given within a few hours of the, uh, of the uh, symptom onset. Now, here's the trick. You got to figure out if it's a clot or if it's a hemorrhage. If you give somebody TPA and they've had a hemorrhage, it'll blow their brains out and they will die. Yeah, so you got to figure out if it's a blood clot or if it's a hemorrhage. And if you give it to the wrong guy, you kill him. TPA. If you give it to somebody with a hemorrhage, they're dead. However, if you give it to somebody with a blood clot, which is 70% of the time, you're going to be right. If you give it to somebody with a blood clot, then it's going to save their life. And it's going to save their brain. They won't have a severe a, a reaction. Now that's the trick. So how, what's the difference? If somebody has a stroke, how do you know if it's a blood clot or a, or a hemorrhage? That's the, that's the trick. And the answer is you don't. A stroke is a stroke. You can't tell. So you have to, to look at a, uh, we, we inject, we, what we will do is inject uh, dye into your body and that will, and then take an x-ray of your brain and that will tell us whether it's a clot or, 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 or a hemorrhage. Probably, maybe, unless the blood is in the wrong place. If the blood's in the wrong place, we can't tell. We won't be able to, to definitive, definitively uh, describe uh, the uh, clot as either a clot or a, or a hemorrhage. As much fun as that is. So, this is an, this is an Indian story. Ready? Once upon a time on Fort Belknap, <clears throat> the tribal chairman's son had a stroke. And they took him to the hospital. And they couldn't figure out if it was a, if it was a hemorrhage or if it was a, a blood clot. And so they, uh, they were going to, to life flight him out. But the life flight was doing something else, and they didn't, you know, it would have taken hours to get there. So they waited, and they waited, and they waited, and they tried to figure out, they 
did everything that they could to figure out if it was a, a plot or a hemorrhage. And they waited too long. Uh, finally, they figured they gave him the, the shot anyway. He was starting to suffer. Um, he was starting to die as what was going on. So they gave him the PPA. Turned out to be a blood clot. But of course, he was never the same. Uh, died about six months later from complications of the stroke, unfortunately. But here was the tribal chairman's son, and they, they couldn't figure out whether it was a blood clot or, 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 a, uh, or a hemorrhage. If they, if they had given it to him and it had been a hemorrhage, if they'd given him the TPA, they would have killed him. They didn't want to do that. So being conservative, they waited and they waited and they tried to they tried to get another life flight in. They couldn't get another life flight in. It's the middle of, it's the middle of Montana. So anyway, he, and he died. Eventually he died. He died uh, because of uh, complications from his stroke. Uh, EKG, e, e, ECG or EKG uh, the, is the measure of the electrical discharges that emanate from your heart. It can indicate whether there is an uh, arrhythmia uh, in the heart. It gives medical personnel a picture of the beating pattern of your heart. And this is the, what your heart's supposed to look like. This is what the heartbeat is supposed to look like. Just like this. This is when, if you ever listen to somebody's heart, uh, it would go kathump, kathump, kathump. This is, this is the kathump that we're talking about. And that's the way it's supposed, what it's supposed to look like. Um, an example of a fast heartbeat. This is an example of a slow heartbeat. You can see there's a lot of stuff going on in between each beat. Uh, and this is the uh, chambers empty. Uh, every time the chamber em empties, we get, we get some kind of electrical impulse. This is where it's pumping it throughout the body. Uh, this is where it's, it's uh, uh, emptying into the chambers. So as you can see, you need to see all of these things. This is a fast heartbeat. This is a slow heartbeat. You can't really, this is an error. That's not an error. Well, you can't see the irregular hardening. Uh, okay, this is normal. Uh, this is uh, this is a shifted uh, uh, heartbeat where the individual has had a heart attack, and because of that, uh, the heart isn't it isn't emptying properly in, into the chambers. Uh, this is uh, after they're not really their heart's not really beating properly. As you can see, the uh, the spike isn't tall enough. This is an invor inverted heartbeat. Uh, this is several days later. It's returning to normal here. It's returned to normal after the attack, after the heart attack. Cardiac stress test, test is administered to watch the heart under stress to determine if there is any blockage. Um, they not only do an EKG while under stress, but they also do an electro, uh, echocardiogram to get an image of the heart after the stress. And of course, uh, what you will do, I've had a couple of these things, they're a lot of fun. Uh, you'll go and you'll walk on a treadmill, and they're doing an EKG while you're walking, while you're exercising. Uh, so they're looking at you while you're exercising. Uh, they will keep pumping it up. Uh, they'll take your blood pressure. They'll, uh, they'll, they'll check all your vital signs. And then after, they're, after you're done with the stress test, your heart rate has to get to a certain level. And when I did it, well, I'm not going to, yeah, I'm going to brag, okay? Uh, when I did it, <laughs> they're used to doing these old farts that have, that have no stamina whatsoever. And so I get in there, and I, they start, and of course they give you like 15 minutes to get all this stuff done. And so they, you know, they jack it up a little bit. What they're doing is they're tilting it higher and higher and higher. So you're, you're climbing a mountain. Eventually you're climbing a mountain. Well, I was climbing a mountain. Usually they, the old guys, the really bad guys, the ones that aren't, aren't as healthy as I am, of course, they only last like two tilts. In here, they've gone five, and they're going up to seven is the maximum they can go. And they've already gone up to six, and they made it all the way to seven before they finally turned the damn thing off. <laughs> and they were pissed because usually it takes five minutes to get this thing done, and here I am, it's like 15, 20 minutes later, they finally get me out of the room. Uh, and I go out to the waiting room and they, they, they backed up because normally they get them out faster than that. Anyway. So they don't do it on me anymore. They won't do a, a stress test on me anymore. 
They've done it twice and they screwed up their whole schedule. So because of that, they won't do it anymore. Uh, coronary angiography, uh, diagnostic test in which dye is injected so that the x-rays can reveal any obstructions in the coronary arteries. Uh, this is a surgical procedure, and so we don't do this very much. Cardiac catheterization, of course, that's what I was talking about. This is actually a cardiac catheterization. They're working down here, and the reason they're working down here is because that's where they open you up. They just make a little slit uh, in, your, in your leg. Uh, they cut open the femoral artery. They run the hose up into your heart. It's not a very thick hose. I'm talking about hose. It's a little, it's a, uh, a wire thing. It's not very big. It feels like it's big, but it's not really all that big. As you can see, what they're, so they're working down here, and they're watching it here. This is, this is where the x-ray is taking place. He's got a monitor right over here on the other side, or here's, here's his monitor, right, about, right beside, on his left side. Usually it's right in front of him. That's where my doctor did his, anyway. Anyway, the cardiac catheterization is then used to repair any blockage with angioplasty, uh, where the plaque or the clot blockage is reduced by, reduced by pressing uh, in against the arterial wall with a balloon, or they can open up the artery with mesh cylinders called stints, and I have three of those in my heart. Once upon a time, you could only have two. Now they're, uh, any, I guess it's unlimited now. I've had three surgeries where they put three stints in my heart. Uh, the cardiac medications, uh, beta blockers. Beta blockers block the action of endogenous catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine, in particular on adrenergic beta, beta receptors of the sympathetic nervous system, which mediates the fight or flight response. So if you have high blood pressure, one of the things they can give you is a beta blocker, and it will reduce the amount of epinephrine and norepinephrine in your system. They would give you a beta blocker if you are really sensitive to um, a stress. If you're sensitive to stress, of course, you've got a high epinephrine and, and norepinephrine level. The problem with beta blockers is that if you ever get into a stressful situation, potentially you won't react properly because you've reduced your, the effect of epinephrine and norepinephrine. And that's a problem with a beta blocker. Uh, calcium channel blockers is another cardiac medication uh, for high blood pressure. It uh, disrupts the movement of calcium through the calcium channels. Uh, so that's, that's what happens with a calcium channel blocker. Uh, and because it does that, it uh, creates a situation where you react less uh, seriously uh, to, uh, to stress. Vasodilators uh, dilate are, are uh, drugs that relax the, the smooth muscle in the blood vessels, which causes the blood vessels to dilate. And of course, that's a vasodilator. Uh, you can take anticoagulants. Uh, they are antithrombics. Uh, they are a class of drug that uh, work to prevent the coagulation of the blood. And this is if you've had a stroke. Uh, if you've ever had a blood clot, of course, that's not my problem, so I don't have to take anticoagulants. Um, my dad did have to take anticoagulants. Uh, Coumadin is, a, is an anticoagulant. Uh, heparin is an anticoagulant. Um, a warfarin is another anticoagulant. Uh, thrombo, thrombolytic agent, agents are medicines that dissolve blood clots uh, in a procedure termed uh, thrombolysis. Uh, so most people who have high blood pressure are probably on calcium channel blockers. If they have a really serious problem, they're on beta blockers. Uh, there's just a ton of different um, uh, blood pressure medications. I'm on two. Both of them are calcium channel blockers. One of them allows me to sleep really heavily at night, <laughs> which pisses my wife off. <laughs> <laughs> because she goes to bed and it takes her 20 minutes to fall asleep. I go to bed and it takes me 13 seconds to fall asleep. And that really irritates her. You know how irritating that can possibly be. So you got to pop it in before you go to bed? I'm sorry? You got to pop it in before, before you go to bed? Yeah, I'm supposed to. Or does it just, because you're constantly taking it every day, it just stops your habit? No, no, I have to take it every day. Every day. Which pisses my wife off, like I said. <clears throat> <laughs> Lysinopril. <laughs> Uh, why don't we stop right here? I think we can stop right here. Yeah, let's stop right here. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to go over.